Okay, so while, uh, while that's circulating around, <coughs> let's us get started. So uh, welcome back. My name is uh, Dr. Coral Morant, and I'm going to be working through um, some systems physiology with you. So we're actually just going to pick up in physiology two, where physiology one uh, left off. I know there's been a summer in between, but I hope that along the way we can wake up some of those neurons that had some of that physiology one stuff going on and then roll it into, uh, roll it into physiology two. So real quick, uh, so what's gonna happen for today is uh, we'll go over the course outline and we'll talk about how the course is structured so we're all comfortable with what's about to happen. And then um, we're gonna dive right into the material. We got lots of cool stuff to go through, so there is no better time to start like, uh, like the present. So I guess in terms of course, um, uh, course description, course information, let's think a little bit about where you've been and then a little about where we're going here so you can kind of see how it all fits. So where you've been in human physiology one, you started thinking about cells and then you thought that cells had membranes, which makes a real communication problem across the body. If you pack a cell in a membrane, now you gotta get over that membrane. So you talked about membrane receptors and channels and that type of stuff, and second messengers and way, the way you can get at communicating with a cell. And then you talked about communication between cells. So how do, commun how do cells communicate between each other? And so you, you talked about a really fast way of doing that. So you hooked up a ner uh, an electrical system, so nerves ways of communicating between two cells over large distances. And then you talked about things like paracrine uh, and endocrine, so hormonal, a slightly, a slightly slower way of communicating between two cells. So we're gonna launch a product into the bloodstream and have it circulate around to find that other cell that needed the communicating. Okay, okay so we're going to continue along that theme of communication. Okay, so when you ended Human Phys 1, what you did was you took all of that communication knowledge that you gained and you made a system work, right? So you, you looked at the gastrointestinal tract. And the gastrointestinal tract is really just a glorious example of communication at its finest, how you communicate autocrine, paracrine, endocrine, and neurally in order to make a whole system work. So now we're gonna put all those communication uh, uh, methods together and make like digestion and absorption work. So you put those communication skills to use and made something bigger happen, digestion and absorption, okay? So in this class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start putting systems together to see then how the body maintains itself. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off by putting the heart together with blood vessels to look at how this, to look at how those two systems are going to be put together to maintain homeostasis of a certain variable. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. So we're going to put the heart and the blood vessels together to see, uh, and then we're going to shake on a little bit of kidney to see how the body is going to maintain your blood pressure. Right. So we're going to put systems together to, to make something bigger happen. How does the body maintain blood pressure? Then we're gonna look at respiration uh, to see how the body maintains things like oxygen and CO2. And then we're gonna put respiration together with the kidney, so two systems together again, to see how the body is going to regulate your pH. And then we're gonna put all those systems together, heart, vasculature, kidney, respiration, to see how your body manages its whole self. Okay, so how the body then manages stresses like exercise or altitude or blood loss, those types of things. Okay, so what we're doing, is we're just gonna continue what you were doing in Phys 1, which was building, right? We're gonna continue that building on in Phys 2. Okay, so that's essentially where we're headed in this course. And at the end, I would like us to be able to sit and think about, okay, I'm gonna throw out an example of, you've just lost a liter of blood, what happens? Okay, so you will survive that challenge, your body is built to be able to survive that kind of insult. That's one fifth of your entire blood volume gone, but your body can manage that. So we're gonna be able to, and then I'm gonna be able to throw out things like, okay, so let's say you're in left heart failure, what happens? Let's say you're in right heart failure, what happens? So the reason we're gonna be able to do this is because the, the, the way that we put the problem solving together 
is really from a first principles approach. So you're being taught, you, you might not have seen it in Phys 1, but you're going to see it here. You're being taught physiology from a first principles approach. And what does that mean? It kind of means it's more like a math. So when you learned to add, you learned the principle of addition. You didn't go and memorize what the sum of all two numbers were. Right? You learned the principle of addition. And now I can throw out any two numbers and bam, you've got it. You didn't have to memorize it. Okay, the same thing is going on here. The body operates around a certain set of principles. Right? Mean arterial pressure. That's something that keeps constant. There's only a certain number of things that help us keep mean arterial pressure constant. So in any situation, if you get mean arterial pressure out of whack, you know those systems are going to change. But only those systems. Not everything. Okay? In terms of regulating oxygen and CO2, if you get, if I throw out a scenario where oxygen and CO2 change, there's only a certain number of systems that are going to react to that. And only those systems will react to that. So we can predict, if you can look at a situation, let's say like left heart failure, and say, oh, I think oxygen's going to go down, we know exactly how the body's going to react. Because we know what is driving, keeping, well, you know, what systems are driving, keeping that variable constant. Okay, so we're going to be learning it from a very problem-solving, critical thinking point of view. Because when, when you're out of here, what I want you to be able to do is in any class or in any situation to be able to have a scenario thrown at you where you can kind of go, you know what, I think the body would do this, this, and this. Right? Not a memorized piece of junk. That's no good. There's not enough room up here to memorize all the physiology. Right? So we're going to learn it from its first principles so that... You can give your best guess at how the body might react. Now, the interesting part about this problem solving is there may be multiple right answers. And people are not usually happy with that type of variability. They don't know the right answer. What's it going to do, Coyle? Is it going to go up by three or what? I don't care. I just care whether it goes up. Okay? You might make it go up more. Someone else might make it go up less. And you're going to get two different answers. That's totally okay. Okay? You're operating the same principles. It's all good. And once we argue about how much did someone make it go up, we will come to a common answer. But you just have to be comfortable here with a little bit of um, a little bit of variability. Okay? I'm totally cool with it. When we grade, sometimes there's four answers to the same question. And they're all right, depending on what your assumptions were. Okay? So we're gonna get comfortable with that, uh, that variability as well. But we're gonna practice that. That's not something that's just gonna be sprung on you. Uh, we're going to practice that, okay? All right, so what else do we need to talk to you about? So learning objectives, yeah, they're great. Uh, oh, core, core structure, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the structure of the whole thing. Lectures, Tuesday, Thursday. <coughs> Day period until 10, so those will be a constant. And then there's this little fun thing on Friday. So I have no really good... Uh, a name for what to call it yet, but these are our problem solving sessions. Okay, so this is where we're going to get that practice with problem solving. Most Fridays will have this practice with problem solving in it, but some days don't. So obviously by tomorrow I will not have given you enough information today for us to solve anything. Okay, so we're just, just going to go ahead and lecture in that spot tomorrow. So in the um, the, lect the tentative lecture schedule, you'll see when there's something, uh, uh, when there's a topic in that spot, for instance, on Friday, we're going to talk about the cardiac cycle, that indeed will be a full-on lecture. Okay, when it's not a lecture, it's going to say problem solving. Okay, so you can see that uh, the first Friday, there's a lecture. The second Friday, there's uh, practice problem solving. Third Friday, there's problem solving. Fourth Friday, there's problem solving. Uh, fifth Friday, there's no class. That's the that's the Friday before Thanksgiving, and I will just be here talking to myself. So I just figured we'll cancel class because I think the problem solving is like two thirty to three thirty. So go home early. And that so anyway, so all I'm um, saying is, is just watch that space. Okay, sometimes it's a lecture, sometimes it's the problem solving sets. Okay, so just watch what's happening there. <coughs> what else have we got here? 
resources. So we have a textbook for the uh, course that's recommended, not required, it's recommended, the textbook of medical physiology by Guyton and Hall. Um, the 13th edition, but you can use the 12th or 11th, whatever you've got. Um, the reading lists for any, for the 11th, 12th, and 13th edition are, have all been translated. There's been no major basic physiology invented in the last 10 years, so it really doesn't matter what edition you use. Um, they've just made the pictures prettier, so that's really not worth the cost. It's not a required textbook, but it is a really good resource for me and for this course in that it teaches nothing like me. It's the exact opposite of me, which is great for you because if you don't get me, then you've got this other resource to go look at it and read it, and then it'll, Guyton will explain it to you in a different way, so you will have seen it maybe in two very, from two very different points of view. Okay, so that's a really good resource for me and the way I lecture and for this course. So it will be different, but that's actually, that's actually a strength. And there's quite a few copies of this, uh, of some edition on the, uh, at the library. Over the years, I've been told very, uh, a, a lot of really good uses for this textbook um, and been sent a lot of pictures on how people use this textbook. And one that I thought I would share from you from your peers wanted me to tell you this, that it is apparently a date magnet. That if you're in like the market, then all you need to do is walk around campus with the medical piece showing and you'll get all kinds of attention. Or especially if like you're, if you're sitting at the brass taps or something, make sure the spine is out so that you can actually see the medical piece and that apparently attracts a lot of attention. So just a secondary use and just, you know, you're welcome. Um, secondary use for the textbook. So anyways, lots of creative uses for the textbook, but that's the one they wanted me to tell you about. The other course resources we have are the, um, uh, the lecture notes. So I sent an email out with lecture notes, um, the first 11 pages, because the PDF is for the first section is way too big, but every section has a set of lecture notes because that's how we're gonna work through the material. Just like your human phys one, we're not gonna use PowerPoint or anything, we're gonna work through notes. So bring these notes with you um, and we will work through them through the entire course. There are two sets up there, one that's just a regular set that I will be using, but during some lectures I grab a blank piece of paper and we start writing. And so folks that are taking notes on computers say that that's problematic for them because they don't have anything blank to write on. So there's a second set of notes uh, in there that says handouts with blank pages, which means that every time I'm predicting I'm gonna grab a blank page, I put a blank page in the handout so that those of you who are actually taking notes on a computer have a blank page there for you to scribble on whatever we're gonna do. So there's two sets there, just pick, pick whatever you need uh, based on how you're taking notes in the course. Uh, what else have we got? TAs for the course. Uh, we have two fabulous TAs for the course. Um, Nicole Fletcher and Logan Townsend. They come to lecture Okay, so they know exactly what happened here between you and me. They'll know exactly how you, how I talk to you and how you speak to me back and forth about uh, physiology. So that makes them really good to tap into as a resource for questions you might have. There's a D2L site. They monitor that site. That's a student TA zone. I don't pop into there. So if you have questions, you can post them. You can email them directly. You can email them and ask them for um, an hour of their time to go over material. I'm a resource for this course. I have an open uh, door policy. I have office hours Tuesday from two to five, but I have an open door policy. If if I'm there, just knock and we'll and we'll uh, it'll get you sorted out. Okay, so don't be afraid whatsoever to reach out for help. There's lots of uh, resources to get you through. Course assessment. All right, so most people want to know how they're going to be assessed in this. So. There is a test one, a test two, and a test three. Okay, so test one and test two are written in class time. Test two is written in the final exam, uh, the final exam slot. The, and then there are problem solving sessions. So that Friday, that Friday thing that happens every, uh, every uh, so often where there are um, group problem solving sessions worth five and 10%. 
So a little bit more detail on the problem solving. So you, when you come in on the Friday, and it's a problem solving session day, you will organize yourself into groups of up to four. Um, if you don't want to organize into a group, that's fine. Um, and then we will, first day will be practice and we'll work through kind of what the expectations are. The second and third day are uh, graded. They're mostly graded just to get you here because if it's not graded, often people won't come. But I really need you to be in here and trying is problem solving because the problem solving that will be happening in that zone will be exactly the type of problem solving ex expected on all three tests. And in fact, some problem solving questions do show up exactly as test questions. So I would urge you to please come and just give it a go, okay? Now the really safe thing about this is, is that if you write, if you're in a group and you write a problem solving session and you get a grade that you're not happy with, and you write another one, let's say the second one, you get a grade um, that you're not happy with, and then you write test one, if your test one is greater than either or both of these, then these two get dropped for you and your in the, t the weighting of your test becomes more, okay? So people who are afraid, of the moment I say group work, I know there's a group here that I'll just wanna run screaming from here. It's no harm, no foul, okay? That just get in that group and have the experience of talking to people about physiology. That's how you problem solve. That's kind of what it's trying to teach you as well right, that problem solving and critical thinking is best done with groups of people where you can argue with each other, okay? Or if you have to teach somebody something, like if someone doesn't understand something and you have to teach it, then you know it. If you can teach it, you know it. If you try to explain it to somebody and you get stuck and you gotta go back, then you're learning it, okay? It's all good, it's all good. Working in groups is critical, okay? And that's all this is trying to show you. So it's a completely safe space when it comes to grades, but I really just want you there for the learning experience, okay? So to be clear, uh, problem solving one and two, the first two, um, if you do better on test one, then the first two will be rolled in or will be dropped and a percentage added to test one. Okay, the same thing will go for the, the third and the fourth problem solving session. If you have a greater grade on your test two, than either the third or the fourth problem solving session, they will be dropped for you automatically and your grade reweighted, okay? So it's all in your favor. But any questions about, someone shoot me a question about that, we usually keep it. Go ahead, yeah. So the question is, bo do both problem solving one and two need to be lower than the test in order for them to go away? And the answer is no. If one is lower and two is higher, I keep two and drop one and we roll it in. It's whatever advantages your grade, okay? So it, yeah, it doesn't have to be both. It's just, yeah, if you can do better on your own than you could in that group, then we will just lump it all in, okay? That work? Another question? All right, we're good there? Okay, cool. And the reason it's being called test one and test two and test three is because these tests aren't cumulative. Okay, so test one will be on a certain set of material, test two will be on a certain set of material, and test three will be. But there's a caveat there, is that this course builds. And I've already told you that by the end, we're gonna be putting all our systems together to figure out how the, how the body responds to exercise. That doesn't mean you can abandon the heart because we've already been tested on it in, in, in um, section one, okay? That means we can abandon some of the real detailed bit, but you will get really comfortable with what pieces you need to bring forward, okay? There'll be no surprises here. And usually when I call something a final exam, people freak out about it, so I'm trying language here as a stress modification tool, so we're gonna see if that works. Right. Uh, all right, and the rest is really just normal course policy. Okay, so the last thing I need to talk I need to talk to you about is lecture capture. So I will be doing lecture capture um, in this course. I think you had lecture capture last year with, or last semester with Dr. Snook. Is that true? So I've been doing lecture capture now for about six years, and I was thrilled to 
to hear that Dr. Snook adopted it as well because I have found the data tells me that it's an incredible resource for y'all, okay? The first time I introduced it into the course, the class grades went up 9%, okay? Because of something we're not sure what, right? So we collect data as we go. So lecture capture is obviously uh, technology heavy already. I've had the microphone cut out on me once, so we're pasting it together here. Um, last year, we did indeed manage to capture all the lectures, so don't, I don't think you should be afraid that you're gonna miss something. Um, if we do miss a lecture, then I have a bank of lectures captured from last year and the year before that we can put up. They're very similar. And so don't be worried about missing. I think we can get, uh, don't worry, worry about missing things if you're not here. I think we can overcome that piece now that we've done this for a little while. So I have been collecting data on it as we go. One of the pieces of information, I'm sure you already know this because you've, you've done this in your last uh, physiology class, um, data that your peers would like to send forward to you is do not procrastinate with it. Okay, do, you know, the worst way we use lecture capture is to wait before the midterm and then watch me 17 times on 1.5. Okay, that is the worst thing to do, okay? Yes, you know who you are, you get that. Um, and so it is true that if I do see, if, if I do see that trend happening, because I can see it, YouTube has amazing analytics, it's amazing what I can tell about who's watching and when, okay? If that behavior starts to happen, then I have to stop, okay? Because that, that behavior is hurtful, it's not helping you, and I need to stop, okay? So I will warn you if I'm seeing that type of behavior, and I will warn you if it's going to stop happening. But I can't introduce something into a course that is going to um, produce a behavior that's more hurtful than good. Okay, so far it's all been good, okay? The, uh, the second thing I'd like to ask is that uh, I do collect data on this because teaching should be a data-driven thing. We should improve our teaching based on uh, based on data we've collected from you. So I will stand up here and say that I solemnly swear to try to capture every lecture and post it on the day of. So I'll try to post it on the day that I captured it because there's about five hours of work to do before I can post it. If you promise to about early to mid-November take a survey that I'm gonna send out because I need to know how you're using this, why you're using it, right? So I need to know because I need to know it's a good tool for this course. But if you tell me this information, I can also advocate to the wider college. I can go to the college and say, look, this is a really good tool for people, for students. We need to adopt it a little more widely. But if you're not gonna give me the data, I can't go talk to them. On this survey too, there is a little bit, there's a couple of questions about um, whether you are a morning or a night person, okay? This information is really critical, I think, in advocating widely for you because there is a whole literature on the fact or supporting the idea that folks that are under 25 are not ready to learn at 8.30 in the morning, right? Y'all are about ready to learn by 10 o'clock, so by the time we finish up, you're ready to go, okay? So um, there's all kinds of data that argue we should be pushing for, if we're teaching folks under 25, we should be pushing our, our days two hours later, right? So that's probably not gonna happen because we live in the real world, but what could happen is I, if I get the data and if I can show that uh, there is a correlation between grades and people who are morning versus night people, et cetera, et cetera, then I can even advocate that not all courses should use lecture capture, but at least the ones in the morning right, so that people will get, so if you're really not a morning person, you can watch this lecture at 12 o'clock when you're ready, okay? But I need the data. So last year, I, I asked the class to do this, and only about 40% of the class responded to that survey. That's not enough for me to advocate, so my hands are tied, so I could not go to the college and say, look guys, I think this is a good idea. I need about 70%. Okay, so if you give me the data, I will absolutely advocate because I think that the lecture capture is an incredible tool. 
right? I also think this is really important too. I also think that it shouldn't just be online, right? Because what will happen is about 60% uh, of you are gonna disappear over the next month, but 40% of you are gonna stay. And I think you're really cool too, because you think you need to be here, and you do need to be here. I was one of those nerds too. I always had to show up and sit there and physics, early physics, you know, what is it, physics 108? I did my undergrad here, by the way. So physics 108, like 8.30 in the morning, who does that? Me, yeah. So I was the person who always had to have that person talk to me, right? I have no idea why, but I really want to, I really want to learn about you too, because I don't want you to be lost in this age of uh, rushing to online learning, right? Because I think online learning is great for a subset of people, but there's also a subset of people here that really need this back and forth. So we have to be able, I have to be able to advocate for both. So all I'm asking, after all that long spiel, is that you just can give me the data to work with. If I have no data, I got nothing, okay? I can't advocate for anything, and we won't move on. Okay, so, any questions at all? Someone must have a question for me about what's gonna happen, because we're diving in. Okay, let's, oh, so these, these lectures, these 80 minute lectures, what we'll do is we'll go for like 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break, and then come back for 20. So if you're, if you're wiggling around and wondering, oh my God, is she ever gonna stop? The answer is yes, I will, and we'll take a breath and then we'll come back for 20 minutes and, and wrap it up, okay? All right, so let's jump into the work. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start putting those systems together. And we're gonna put these systems together to control what we call a regulated variable. Is that a term that was used in Phys 1 have you, or used before, a regulated variable? So a regulated variable is something that the body is going to try to work towards to keep constant. So the body is rigged to keep it constant. So mean arterial pressure is a regulated variable. Right, 120 over 80, that's what we're looking for. We're gonna talk about averages here. I'm gonna talk about mean arterial pressure being an average of about 100, okay? The body is rigged to keep mean arterial pressure at, at an average of 100 millimeters of mercury. Other variables are not regulated. Heart rate, for instance, right? So your own personal experience would tell you your heart, you know that your heart rate has been low. Like when you're sitting here, it's probably anywhere between 50 to 70 beats per minute. Right, but we can jack that up really quickly if you get up and, you know, you go running. Some of you do that altruistically because it's healthy. I need a little bit of help, so if I'm being chased by a bear, I can get that heart rate way up. Okay, it's not a regulated variable because if it was, it wouldn't flux like that. Right, it's because we're using the heart and heart rate as one of the things that's helping us keep mean arterial pressure constant. Okay, so you have the regulated variable and you have the tools that the body is going to use to keep that regulated variable constant, right? Heart, the heart is a tool. How fast the heart beats and how hard it beats to the amount of volume it ejects per minute, those are all not regulated variables. Your stroke volume, the amount of volume your heart can eject per beat can vary from 80, mils per beat up to like 130 to 140 mils per beat, okay? It's not something we regulate. It's a tool that is trying to regulate blood pressure. So the game afoot in physiology is to find out, in order to try to predict how the body's gonna react, is to find what is a regulated variable and what controls it. Because if we can do that, then no matter what, mean arterial pressure does, if it goes up or down, we know exactly the tools to look to and exactly how they're gonna respond in order to restore that mean arterial pressure. That's how we're going to always, that's the first principles. That's how we're gonna be able to predict, no matter what the scenario, what the body's gonna do, as long as, you can, as long as we know what was mean arterial pressure, what are the tools 
to maintain it and if mean arterial pressure goes down, then the tools are going to do this. If mean arterial pressure goes up, then the tools are going to do that. Okay? So what we need to do then is first of all state that indeed mean arterial pressure is going to be a regulated variable, and now we need to collect these tools. Okay, so we're going to spend the next two or three weeks collecting those tools so that by the end of it, once we have the tools available, I can say, all right, we're in right heart failure. What happens? You, you check in on mean arterial pressure, and you tell me what all the tools do. Okay? That's where we're headed. So, indeed, these, um, so we will be studying the tools and how they alter the regulated variable. Okay? So we're going to do that for mean arterial pressure. So any regulated variable is governed by a negative feedback loop. Okay? So this is our classic little negative feedback loop, and if we think about mean arterial pressure as the regulated variable, right, it's pressure, so if it's a regulated variable, the body must be paying attention to what it is at all times, right, or, or the body has to know what it is at every millisecond, so we have to have sensors for that, so it's got to be, so if you're going to have a regulated variable, this is the first principle, if you've got a regulated variable, you have to have a sensor. Right? It can't be regulated if the body doesn't know what's going on. If you're going to have a regulated variable, you've got to have a sensor. Okay? So we've got a regulated variable of pressure, mean arterial pressure, so we're going to have pressure sensors. Right? So we've got to have a sensor, so pressure. pressure sensors, and I'll often confuse the situation by calling them pressure receptors. So that language, there's a language, there's language issues we're going to have to deal with for sure. So we've got mean arterial pressure that's a regulated variable. For the body to know that, we have to be able to input that information to a sensor. What's a sensor? It's just a cell type that's going to be able to change the action potential frequency and pattern in a nerve. All right? If you learned in Human Phys 1 about sensors, the only way that we know anything the only way we can input anything into the brain is that if you change the membrane potential in a nerve, right? You clear on that? That if you can't change the membrane potential on a nerve, our brain has no idea. Right now you're being bombarded with radio waves. Radio waves have no ability to take this and change the membrane potential on a nerve, so I have no idea they're there. We have to make a sensor, like a radio, turn it into a sound wave, and I got, I got sensors for those, right? I turn it into a sound wave. Now I bend a hair in my ear. That hair is attached to a, uh, to, uh, or has the ability to change the membrane potential on a nerve. That information goes in, bam, sound, okay? But the radio wave, I have no earthly idea, okay? So if you're going to sense something, you got to be able to change the action potential on a nerve. So that's what this pressure sensor can do. It's a cell that can somehow change its membrane potential based on probably stretch, right? Pressure is probably going to stretch. High pressures would stretch a cell. Low pressures, they'd be less stretched. So there's probably some stretch-dependent channel. Okay, you guys are comfortable with voltage-dependent channels, ligand-dependent channels. So now I'm just saying, eh, we probably have a stretch-dependent channel too. We give it a little, we give it a little tug and it will change its, whether it's open or closed, okay? So that's not something that's too difficult to, to get or to imagine that it's out there. So stretch receptor that will then suddenly change the uh, membrane potential on a nerve, right? So at the end of the day, you have to change our, our resting membrane potential on a nerve. Uh, and, and then eventually change uh, the action potential frequency or pattern on that nerve, right? Because we can't send in big or little action potentials. You remember that rule? An action potential was a constant size. If you wanted to send in different information, like, whoa, blood pressure went way down versus blood pressure went down a little bit, we couldn't send in a big action potential or a little one. We had to send in the constant action potential. It's all or nothing. 
consequence of that is now we have to code it. So it's got to send it in faster or slower, or you got to send it in a weird pattern that somehow our brain, uh, our brain understands. Is that my time? Okay. That your brain understands, right? So you got to code that action potential. So we got to change the action potential frequency or pattern up into the brain, our coordinating center. We're going to call this the brain stem for now. We're just going to lump in the thalamus, the medulla, those lower brainstem areas. Okay, so that's where we're plugging this information in. It's not coming into the conscious area. You're not consciously aware of your blood pressure right now, are you? So you're going because that would be really cool. Anybody here totally aware of what their blood pressure is right now? Ah, oh, it's too bad because that would be cool. Yeah, so we have no idea. So this is all done at the unconscious level, not the conscious level, right? We do know that that conscious level, so this your cerebral cortex. Your cerebral cortex can affect that coordinating center. So you've all heard anecdotes of folks who, let's say, you know, right before a race, in anticipation of a race, your heart rate goes up, right? So you're not racing yet. The problem with the race, so you're running. The problem with the race is exercise will cause, uh, has the potential to cause a drop in mean arterial pressure. And we'll get into that on like the third last day. We will have put enough information together for you to understand that. But take my word for it right now. Running will cause a drop in mean arterial pressure. So in anticipation, you increase your heart rate, right? So that anticipation came from here, right? Because your lower brain stem doesn't anticipate anything. It just does what it's told. So indeed, there is cross-communication here. And then you need information to come out of that coordinating center then to affect an effector. So let's say mean arterial pressure did drop and we have our pressure sensor change, sense that, change the action potential frequency and pattern in the nerve. That information goes to the brain stem. So now we need to change something. So we have to send information out to change our tools, right? So we gotta change our tools. We have our fastest way to change a tool is to use our sympathetic nervous system or a parasympathetic nervous system, right? And so we're gonna have direct connections from the brain to these tools, right? And these tools are a limited number. Not everything, okay, is a tool. We can change muscle. And in this case, for mean arterial pressure, it's gonna be cardiac muscle. So we're gonna change what the heart does. It's gonna beat stronger, it's gonna beat faster. Okay, so we change the tool. Uh, it can be smooth muscle. So this is going to be a uh, smooth muscle that comprises the outer edge of your blood vessels, right? So you've got smooth muscle wrapped around your blood vessels and if I make it contract, the blood vessel gets smaller, right? And if I relax that smooth muscle, the blood vessel gets bigger. This is a tool. We'll tap that in in a couple of days, All right? That's a tool. So we can change that. Skeletal muscle is not a tool. We absolutely do not want subconscious control over skeletal muscle. Because then just stuff will just happen and you'll have no idea why, right? That's a bad day. All right, skeletal muscle, basic principle, skeletal muscle is always controlled through the voluntary system, through the cerebral cortex. We always want full control over where these pieces are, right? We don't want mean arterial pressure to drop and suddenly a leg, wow, you know, you don't want that happening. You need full control over skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle is not autonomically controlled, okay? The autonomic nervous system doesn't control skeletal muscle within the whole body. Yeah, so when I put muscle up here, so the question was in this context. So there is no muscle, there's no skeletal muscle that will be controlled without conscious thought. No skeletal muscle. Okay, some axial muscle, I probably thought that you were gonna give me, some axial muscles are controlled without us really consciously thinking about it. So right now, me standing up requires skeletal muscle bilaterally. I have abdominal muscles that need to be contracting a little bit. My soleus needs to be contracting to hold me up a bit. I'm not consciously thinking about, okay, contract that, contract that, contract that, because then I can't talk, right? Boring lecture, stand here, watch me stand. 
Okay, so, so there is some, we break every rule, but in the general, the general rule, all skeletal muscle is hooked up to an alpha motor neuron. You guys learned this in Phys 1. The alpha motor neuron, where does it come from? The conscious area, all right? No alpha motor neurons coming out of the coordinating center. Alpha motor neurons come out of the, that override, okay? So, skeletal muscle is not a tool, and we always want conscious thought or, volunt or voluntary movements to be controlled by conscious thought rather than this unconscious stuff. Because remember, you told me you didn't know what your main arterial pressure was right now. So there's no conscious thought over what it is right now or keeping it constant, right? The body's just operating itself, thank goodness. All right, because I don't want to be bothered with that. I got stuff to do, right? So the body's taking care of itself there. We also can uh, affect, uh, we can send information out to muscles, so those are our tools, and also glands. So this will help us get hormones out, which can then help us with our tools, okay? So at the end of the day, the coordinating center uh, can change effectors through the glands, um, and then you get this hormonal response. So I'm going to put hormones hormones up here as a way essentially of the coordinating center being able to communicate with the effector. So obviously we've got our two major communication systems out there on two different time scales, right? Those will be happening on very different time scales. You could change something really quickly, eh, it would take a minute, okay? So then those are going to change their behavior, the tools, in order to bring our mean arterial pressure back to normal, okay? So that's we whipped around that negative feedback loop, okay? Classic negative feedback loop. So essentially, let's, that's kind of in theory here. Let's think about it practically. That if I've got uh, my mean arterial pressure over time, arterial pressure over time, and let's say we wanted to regulate it around 100. We said that's what the body was trying to do, right? So it's a very good day that it's sitting there at around 100. And then you stress the system, okay? Stress doesn't have to be stress like the word you might know it in the popular sense, like mental stress or I'm stressed from too many tasks or what have you, stress on the body can be as, uh, as simple as going from sitting down to standing up. Okay, that will stress you, and you will whoop through this loop like crazy. Okay, so when you stand up from, uh, at the end of the class today, I want, you to turn all, I want to turn you all into nerds. I want you to think about, oh my gosh, my negative feedback loop. Okay, because what's going to happen is, you're sitting there, and your mean arterial pressure is about 100, and, and that's being constantly monitored, right? The system didn't shut off. The system has to know, it's 100, don't change anything. It's 100, don't change anything. It's 100, don't change anything. Okay, so there's nothing off. It's always monitoring, always cycling, right? So then you go from sitting down to standing up. What happens there? Gravity pulls your blood volume down into your legs, okay? That pulls it away from where we're measuring blood pressure, it's up about here, All right? So suddenly we get less volume up here, we get less pressure up here. So our body thinks, ah, blood pressure dropped, fix this, okay? So you went from sitting, life is good, and then you stood up, okay? Your blood pressure dropped. So then your sensors sense that, changed the active potential frequency and pattern in a nerve, sent that to the coordinating center, and out information came nervously, because this happens right away, right? Nervously, you changed how your heart worked, you changed how your blood vessels worked, and then you, so you started to increase your heart rate, you started to increase the contractility of your heart, so you're pumping more volume out per beat, and you constricted your blood vessels to get that blood back up to where it belongs, okay? So then your mean arterial pressure started to come back up, which is great. So mean arterial pressure is coming back up, but we've got things fired up. Heart rate's high. Blood vessel's constricted. So we're gonna overshoot, right? So your blood pressure, so then your system goes, oh gosh, too high, shut her down. So too high, 
drop our frequency and pattern, decrease the amount of outputs, decrease our heart rate, decrease our, our contractility, start to vasodilate. Okay, so it's just great. It's gonna bring it, bring it back down. But you got stuff all shut down, right? So then you will go low, then you will go high, and then you will go low. So this is why, so this is homeostasis. You don't sit at a mean arterial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury until life changes. It's constantly fluxing, okay? A very healthy system has very little flux, okay? So a very healthy system has all the tools on board, right? A very healthy system might look like this, okay? That's usually in younger people. You've got all your systems intact. The natural process of aging is some of these systems tend to not work as well, so the fluxes will get higher, okay? But this is what homeostasis looks like. We try to keep it at an average of 100, um, but because we are using this to maintain it, you're going to get this fluxes above and below 100 for your entire life, okay? So we're monitoring all the time. Homeostasis, and you guys did talk a little bit about allostasis. Does that go all the way back to biology of health? That term allostasis where you think about how blood pressure changes over the full lifespan? Yeah. So the question was, when I talk about an average mean arterial pressure, am I talking about the average population, or am I talking about um, average across your lifespan? Is it in the in the homeostasis? So, so right. So, the your body does regulate, wants to regulate for your entire lifespan around 100. Right, that, and the reason that we need to, so the reason that the 100 is this magic number is that's the driving pressure we need to feed the rest of our tissues. If you do not have that driving pressure, somebody's not getting blood flow, right? So that's the reason for 100 being critical, right? If it's 80, an average of 80, somebody's getting too little blood flow. If it's too high, somebody's getting too high blood flow, right? So that there is the body uh, wants to maintain that mean arterial pressure of 100 to operate um, whether you're, um, well, we'll stick with adults because kids are weird, whether you're uh, 20 or whether you're 40 or whether you're 60, your body wants to achieve 100. How it achieves that, that variability might change with age because of your, how, how many tools you have and how good your tools are, um, but it is over a whole lifespan. Does that answer your question? Okay. Are right, we good? So obviously to understand then how all of that happened and we gotta, we gotta talk about the tools. We gotta go in and we gotta see how the tools work and we gotta see how they're controlled, right? As soon as we see how they work and how they're controlled, we just have to talk a little bit about sensors and bam, we can work the system, okay? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time then talking about talking about our tools, okay? See where we're headed? And let's do that after a 10 minute break, okay? So that's that's totally override. Yeah. yeah. So and that and that would be yeah and that would be a connection outside of outside of that uh, autonomic nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, get back at it. <coughs> so just uh, a couple of questions came up during the break, and I don't and I didn't feel like I adequately answered a student's question when they asked it, and I just want to make sure we're clear on. The question about the populational norm of mean arterial pressure being 100, I think that that was a question that came up. I'm not sure I answered your question completely correctly, so I'm just gonna give it another go. 
um, the population, the, the average mean arterial pressure, yes, would be a populational norm, but we all have inter, well, there's all kinds of uh, variability, so you might have uh, somebody sitting beside you who regulates their mean arterial pressure around 97, okay. You might have someone sitting beside you who regulates their mean arterial pressure around 102 on average, okay. But it's, you, you know, it's not going to be the person sitting beside you regulates their mean arterial pressure under healthy conditions around 120. So we do not have that level of variance, but there is, you know, your common human variability around what number we're regulating. And we're gonna use the number 100, but just be comfortable with, you know, that's uh, uh, an over-exaggeration of an average. Now that being said, you can get pathological and have people who have pathological blood pressures of 120 on average, right? So someone who has a systolic uh, blood pressure of 150 and a diastolic of 110 or 120, their average mean arterial pressure is gonna be around 130, or, okay? So you can have pathological situations where mean arterial pressure is not 100. Now the interesting thing about this sensor, and we're gonna learn this a little bit more because after we think about our tools, we're gonna think about our sensors. So jumping ahead a little bit, this sensor, does adapt. Do you remember you talked about fast adapting and slow adapting type of sensors in uh, Human Phys 1? This pressure sensor will adapt. This is not great for us and our current lifestyle. Okay, so if you do have a blood pressure that stays high on average 120 for two, for like three to five days, that sensor will adjust and say, oh, it looks like 120 is the new norm, so I'm gonna set that as my new set point and now you will regulate around 120. This is bad news, because now when your blood pressure does drop to 100, your body goes, oh, it's too low, and pops it back up to 120. Okay, so when you start regulating around a new set point, things go bad, fast, okay, real bad day, right? But the good thing is, is if you can get your blood pressure down to 120 for three to five days, it'll reset itself as well. So that's where it's common that medication comes into play to try to get people's blood pressure down to uh, the normal zone for a set period of time so that that sensor will, will reset itself, okay? So there is human variability when it comes to this average mean arterial pressure around 100, um, and there are all kinds of pathological states, okay? Is there a question for me around that? Have, did I, I think I did better on the populational thing there. There, okay, thank you. Okay, good, all right, let's look at our tools. <coughs> so we're gonna pop then into the cardiovascular system. <coughs> in beginning exploring what our tools are. So for our cardiovascular system, some you know, 30,000 foot uh, general principles here. On a good day, it's a closed circuit system. I'm gonna write that down now, but the implications of that won't come for probably another five, six lectures, okay? But what this really means is, if it's a closed circuit system, then if I mess with one part of the system, it's going to affect the other. So you cannot mess with the cardiovascular system, the heart, and all of the vessels, you cannot mess with their things independently. If you are going to change heart rate, you are going to change blood pressure. If I'm gonna change pressure in the arteries, that is going to change pressure in the capillaries and the veins. It's gonna change what the heart's doing, right? So the closed system means if I mess with one part, I affect another, okay? But we will harp on that like you would not believe in a couple weeks. Uh, so essentially all we're looking at in terms of our cardiovascular system is uh, two pumps and some pipes. <coughs> okay, so I've modeled the system here as uh, a pump. So our left, we've got one pump, our left heart, which heads into our arteries, and which then flows into our arterioles and then flows into capillaries. Okay, so here's our pipes. <coughs> they flow into veins, <coughs> excuse me, which then flow back to our second pump, our right heart, 
the right heart, and then we uh, move blood from our right heart up into our pulmonary system now. So we have pulmonary arteries. Okay, we have our capillaries at the level of the lung. So a capillary bed at the lung. Another capillary bed that feeds into pulmonary veins which then feeds the left heart again, okay? So if that's how we're gonna structure our pumps and our pipes, then we really have to embrace the idea that we have two pumps. It is one organ, wildly, it is one organ where the two pumps do behave similarly. But you can tell just by the circuitry that I me if I mess with the left pump, if I stop pumping the left pump, I'm gonna get back up of blood into the lungs and less blood into the arteries, right? That's very different than what's gonna happen if I stop the right heart. I get no blood in the lungs and all kinds of blood in the veins, okay? So we have to really embrace this idea that we have two pumps. They happen to work together, one organ, but there are functionally two pumps there. And then of course we got all these pipes and all these pipes are for different things, okay? So we have arteries in our systemic system, so let me add that jargon on here as well. Anything that deals with the entire body itself, um, below the left heart, or between the left heart and the right heart this way, is called systemic, right? So these would be systemic arteries and systemic arterioles. So the terminology here is to use systemic. And then everything between the right heart and the left heart, it's, the, it's, just one, it's just one tissue between the right heart, the left heart, the lungs. So those are called the, or classified as the pulmonary. The pulmonary system. So you can see that you have pulmonary arteries and you have systemic arteries. And you see you have pulmonary capillaries and you have systemic capillaries. You have pulmonary veins, you have systemic veins, okay? So those two words, pulmonary and systemic, tell you where you are between the left heart and the right heart. Okay, so those are pretty important words. You can't just say arteries anymore because now I don't know where you're at, okay? <coughs> All right, so these pipes that we've put in place, they have different purposes. We pump blood from the left heart into the artery systemic arteries in order to transport blood from that heart down to the capillaries because we want to exchange at the level of the capillaries oxygen, CO2, nutrients, that type of stuff, right? Uh, so each of these pipes have to have different characteristics to facilitate those different jobs. So you can't structure a transport vessel the same as you structure a capillary. They have to be structured differently specifically for their job. So a transport vessel, what does that look like? It's a really rigid tube with not a lot of elasticity. It's just a tube, you put blood in it, it's gonna transport blood from A to B, boom, job done. Okay, at the level of the capillary, you want exchange to happen there. So you have to strip off all that smooth muscle, strip off everything. We just need an end, we need, as we need that blood as close to tissue as we possibly can. So we're just gonna put an endothelial cell layer and a basement cell layer membrane between the blood and the tissue. So now things can freely diffuse, right? We gotta strip off all the stuff that's gonna cause problems for diffusion. So capillaries are made up just of a tube of endothelial cells, okay? So these things are built differently. Classic functional compartmentalization, okay? So you saw this before, this principle on how the body's built in the digestive system, the digestive tract, you had sections of the di digestive tract that were built in a specific way for a very specific job, okay? That's what's happening here. So the cardiovascular system is very functionally compartmentalized. That's what we mean by that, okay? So it's a very functionally compartmentalized system. So we are very functionally compartmentalized here. Okay, these, uh, so indeed what we have is the left heart pumping blood into the systemic arteries. Now, 
uh, in terms of the capillary beds, in terms of uh, delivery, we're, what we're doing there is we're taking blood. We're, we've got a pump that's setting the highest pressure in the system to into a transport system that's going to then direct blood into up to 600 capillary beds. All right, so you have all kinds of things between the right heart or between the left heart and the right heart. You've got uh, you've got the gut down here has its own capillary bed. You've got all your skeletal muscles. You've got about 600 of those. So each one of those have their own capillary beds. You got the liver, the pancreas. Oh my gosh, you got all kinds of stuff going on that you're feeding with that left heart pressure. Okay. So we have 600 vascular beds we got to send that blood flow to. But we don't need to send them to them all equally. And we had better be able to readjust depending on what the human is doing. Okay, so you're eating a meal. You want to be able to direct that blood flow to the gut and not to the muscles. Common rule of thumb, don't go swimming an hour after you eat, right? Why is that? Because you want to direct blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract and not skeletal muscle. And in fact, blood flow is being directed there. And if you do then work out, swim, th that muscle, those muscles aren't gonna get as much, or aren't getting as much flow as you would normally get. You're gonna fatigue quicker, potentially drown. Okay, so that's where these kind of rules of thumb come from because of how your body is allocating where blood flow is going. This behavior, eating, I've got to direct more blood flow to the gut. So how do you do that? You've got to be able to then clamp down blood flow, decrease blood flow to, smooth, to skeletal muscle, and increase blood flow to the gut. So you've got to have something, you've got to have change, you've got to be able to change resistance, right? You've got to be able to make it less resistant for blood flow to go to the gut, and more resistant for blood flow to go to the skeletal muscle, okay? So you have these resistance arterioles. That's what they're hanging out here for. That's what these are. Okay, so these are spots where you get wicked control over smooth muscle contractility. You have the ability, actually, when you're uh, uh, during the fight or flight response, to actually really shut down your gut. Because if, it's, if you're going to have to fight or flee, you don't want to digest. That's not going to help, right? Bear chasing, you don't want to go, oh, I need that nutrient. You don't want that, right? You want to get the hell out of here. Right? So you need blood to be ready to go to skeletal muscle. So you will shut down blood flow to the gut and increase blood flow to muscles ready to go. How do you do that? Vasoconstrict, contract smooth muscle around the resistance arteries to the gut, right? So blood flow doesn't go there. And vasodilate or relax smooth muscle in the resistance arterioles that are feeding skeletal muscle, right? So now we can get, now we can put blood flow around the body where we need to. We have this set of resistance arterioles, okay? Depending on what a human's doing. We can get, um, once we get blood in, so resistance arterioles, functionally compartmentalized, resistance arterioles are really good. We are plugged into those resistance arterioles to be able to change their diameter in a crazy way. We can't really do that at the artery. Why would we at the at the artery? Why would we care? That's transport. We just need to get it there, and the resistance arterioles will be dictating where it goes. Okay, so those two are built very differently. We can get it to the capillaries, where to optimize for exchange, up into the veins, and then back into our right heart. Our right heart then is in charge of pumping blood through one capillary bed. Okay, let's be clear. One capillary bed. The lungs. So the need for resistance arterioles up here is minimal. There's only one. So you're not going to see. There is a set of resistance arterioles up here. We're not entirely sure what they're doing or what they're for. We don't have a lot of control over them, and I don't think we do want a lot of control over them. It is never a good idea to decrease blood flow to your lung. Okay? So we do have a resistance arterioles up here. But they aren't remotely the same as the systemic resistance arterioles. Okay? Because they don't have the, we don't have the same need. There's one vascular bed. We don't need to be the, uh, 
choosing where blood flow is going around the body. Uh, lung capillary bed, pulmonary veins, and then back into the left, back into the left heart, and you do it all again, okay? Two pumps, pipes. Okay, so really critical is that we embrace the notion that there are two hearts. Okay, really critical that you change a little bit of your thinking on that. But again, we will work hard to show you that that is true. The other thing, the other common um, definition that we need to change is what the definition of an artery is. So the definition of an artery commonly includes the oxygenation status of the blood. So people will often say, well, arteries have oxygenated blood. Not true, okay? This artery, this pulmonary artery, has deoxygenated blood. We're about to send it to the lung to be oxygenated, okay? So the definition of an artery and the definition of like a vein, people will often say, well, veins have deoxygenated blood in them, right? True for a systemic vein, but not true for a pulmonary vein. It's already been by the lungs. We've put all that oxygen in there, and now we have pulmonary veins full of oxygen. So the definition of an artery and a vein has nothing to do with the oxygen status in it, in the blood, in it, okay? And has everything to do with what it's doing. So for instance, arteries, what arteries do is they take blood away from the heart. Okay, so a systemic artery takes blood away from the left heart. A uh, pulmonary artery takes blood away from the right heart. Okay. Okay, and veins. Definition of a vein, again, nothing to do with the oxygenation status. But takes blood to the heart. They are vessel. There are pipes that take or deliver blood to the heart. Okay. So with that brief overview, we're going to then start to go into the pumps and the pipes. So tomorrow, and tomorrow the lecture isn't at 8:30. Just let's be clear, right? It's at 2:30 or something like that. We're going to start in at the heart. Okay, we'll see you then.